Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Blair Davies, and this is Jeffrey Kerr. Uh, we're from Engineered Assemblies, and we're here to talk about uh, thermally broken ventilated facades and um, why and what's going on in the marketplace, et cetera, and I'll explain the agenda. But um, just throw the intent right on the table. Uh, we're obviously got a solution. If you don't know that by now, I guess uh, I'm not doing a very good job in marketing. But um, what we're really trying to achieve in coming here today is to drive change. So concept of thermally broken facades has been around a long time. Uh, solutions are available now. Uh, but they're not being employed as quickly as one might have thought. I mean, if you have a, you know, uh, uh, if you had a car and everybody had a horse and carriage, and uh, you'd be kind of wondering why the car wasn't being picked up or other examples of technology and of innovation. So um, our intent here is just we want you to know what's going on in the marketplace and what's going on for the design choices you can make so you can change, so you can grow and so you can do the right thing. Uh, and then, of course, I want you to buy boxes and boxes and boxes of T-clips. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's, this is really an engineering discussion about what's happening in the marketplace. Um, and Jeff and I are going to mix the slides back and forth. Um, basically, going to cover the scope of this. I'm going to try to define the place a little bit for you. Talk about what's happening in the market and the code. Um, we're pretty knowledgeable in the code. If you really want to know the code, you go to the code guys. But, you know, I can tell you our perspective on having helped design and build buildings. We'll talk about the impact to the actual building. We'll talk about a design solution and some of your design solution choices and a comment or two on the future. Um, I assume you kind of looked into who we were or you wouldn't have signed up for the event. Um, but basically what we do is we're working with architects to design buildings across Canada. We sell products. Um, and then in Ontario, we have a construction company called Proxy Cladding. And um, the purpose in explaining that is the three go together. So if I'm detailing a job, in Halifax or Vancouver or Northern Quebec or wherever, we're doing it based on knowledge of how to build buildings uh, because we're building them. So um, I've got one of these little rings on. Uh, we've got you know, 35 employees. We've got lots of knowledge and, and skills and capabilities in the cladding industry. So uh, this isn't some kind of piece of theory. Um, and uh, if you're interested in, we do have some clipboards we're going to hand around. And if you're interested in, in you know, being part of us, and knowing more about what we do, um, you can sign up, give us your name and email address, and you can either do that here today or online. Um, and um, without being a little too spiritual, the reason why we're doing all this is because the world. I mean, it, it, this is a pretty big issue. And I guess I feel like I can get out of bed in the morning and say, I'm trying to create some change. And that's, that's really what it's about. And um, the, uh, the, the interesting phenomenon when you go to the United States, you go to Europe, um, our weather is pretty bad. Uh, our, our use of energy is pretty high. Uh, we could be the leaders in this. Uh, we could be the people in the world that are trying to create the change around this, but we actually aren't. We're actually, once again, uh, you know, and I'm born and bred Canadian, we're behind. Uh, we could be the ones that are, are signaling to the world this is the right way to do things. And I guess I, since I get the bully pulpit, uh, uh, I'm going to say, step up. Let's go. Let's do it. Um, Let's define it just a touch more uh, and what we're talking about. Because there's a lot to this. Of course, building a building is a complex thing. We're talking about thermal bridging. We're talking about the exterior opaque walls. So I'm not a window expert. We're not a roofing expert. We're talking about ventilated facades using panels. And we'll define that a little bit more. So this isn't about masonry. This isn't about precast. Um, so this is about the panel industry. Uh, and it is the ICI building market, so it's not residential. We do some custom residential, and I can give you some commentary on that. But this is steel stud or steel frame construction uh, typically used in the ICI market. So that, that sort of defines the type of building we're talking about. And um, I think you've seen these. I mean, these are sort of directional statements. But you know, half, the uni uh, half the world's use of energy is in buildings, and half of that energy loss is in the walls. So uh, it's a pretty big item. We're not talking about trying to make a building 2% better. Uh, this is a pretty big item on a pretty big world stage. Um, and uh, the, the why, um, so windows continue to get better, and you will have more windows. We need light in our buildings, except for this room. Uh, we need light in the buildings. Um, 
But actually, the code starts to tell you uh, to how to have less windows. So the idea that you'd have a building that's all glass is probably in the past. Um, roofing, uh, people have been doing thermally broken, high insulated roofs for some time. You know, you've got a pitch or you've got a slight slope or you have a flat roof. It's not that hard to do. Um, so having really high R values in roofs is not technologically challenging. It's not that hard to get a really well insulated foundation. Um, uh, so that's not, you know, one of the technological innovations right now. I mean, it's been done, it's proven, know how to do it. And so the war right now on, on thermal loss of the building is around the opaque walls. Um, and this particular building is the uh, Collingwood Fire Hall. And uh, just to tell the story, it probably would have got built the old way, except the architect uh, at MCL, he said, well, I've got these new codes in front of me, and I'm kind of wondering what, I, what I'm supposed to do with them. And he was the one who led the whole team, including the building officials, to do this building right. And at first, you sort of go, why would a, why would a fire hall need to have you know, high R value, thermally broken walls? Well, the thing's running 24-7, 365, more than a school, more than a house, more than a retail organization. The thing's on and running 24-7, 365. So having a properly built, uh, efficient building is a critical success factor for the use of that building. Um, uh, and uh, th so the, the, in essence, trying to define the space a little bit down to the opaque walls, commercial buildings, ventilated facades with uh, panels. Um, and uh, we'll show these charts a few times. And uh, if you haven't seen them, they're pretty straightforward. The one on the left is not how to do things. And that's having a girt going through the insulation layer. And because it's light green, that means heat loss is coming out of the building. And it's not just coming because it's connected to studs in behind, it's actually coming because that girt reaches all the way over to the warm side. So oftentimes people think, well, I'll create a thermal break between that girt and the studs, and that does it. Well, in fact, you almost have it anyways because there's a piece of sheathing there. But the fact that that girt is on the warm side of the insulation means heat's getting out the building. And these aren't pretty pictures. These are, uh, these are the results of the modeling that Morrison Hirschfield does. And then the, build the product or the, the wall on the right, um, I mean, obviously, I'm going to tell you that that's ours. I mean, that's the system that we're talking about today. And other thermally broken systems get you so that all the things on the outside are cold and all the things on the inside are warm. So it's, it's not much more complicated than that, except that the knowledge of how to um, create thermally broken facades has come a long way ahead. And uh, if you were here last year, I apologize, but I pulled out this textbook. I, went, I graduated engineering school in 1985. Uh, I had a building science course on page 187, topic 8.17, thermal bridges. <laughs> and uh, this is a classic building science for a cold climate uh, used at most of the universities. Thermal bridges through building closures can take many forms. And then, of course, it does. And so I've just defined it a little bit. When temperature differences become large, condensation may occur, creating a nuisance and promoting deterioration. So there's another problem with thermal bridges. Um, there may be undesirable effects owing to increased heat flow or decreased surface temperatures. So uh, this was 1985, and then, so it's not like ringing out some massive alarm. Um, but one of the things that uh, one of the things it did say is, is it will be evident that the analysis of thermal bridges is not a simple matter. Two or even three-dimensional heat flow is involved in situations that are often complicated geometrically, and that's really what's changed. And the work that you know good engineering firms have done to model what's happening with this, um, with this wall on the left is why we're here today and why we're in a, in a position of having unrefutable knowledge that this matters. And you know, my memory of uh, civil engineering in 1985 was, hey, this is something interesting, but if you take the weighted average of the areas of these insulations and you simply calculate that that one's got, you know, a the metal gets about 1,000 more uh, times the conductance, and you multiply that out by the weighted average, it doesn't come out to such a big number. But it turns out that that's not the way it works. And it, it is a short circuit. Or we, Jeff and I kind of facetiously created this uh, uh, image when we were presenting um, in, uh, in Montreal and trying to get our point across with our poor French. Uh, they used to design boats like this. Uh, back in the days of Nelson, boats leaked. And there wasn't much that they could do about it. So they ran around the world pumping them all the time. And as long as you pump fast enough, the ship stayed up. And in essence, that's what we're doing with buildings. We still are in 2014. And you can take a walk outside this hotel and see buildings that are under construction right now. 
And, uh, and you're going to see, you're going to see basically thermal bridges that are creating leaks. And as long as the heat's up enough, uh, it's going to work. The building's going to be fine. Nobody, the, the users aren't going to complain. The guy paying the bill eventually is going to complain. Um, but um, in essence, that's what we're trying to stop. Why, why, why would you build a boat with a hole in it and just pump harder? Uh, we're saying, you know, build the thing right and not have that, uh, not have that problem. Um, now, there's lots of sources to support this, and I, I created this chart under the, uh, under the sort of paranoia, like, hey, this guy's just said all that stuff. How does he know it's true? I didn't invent this. This is all from not common knowledge. So there's some really good data out there, and you can search under it, and you can read it. And the good news is we'll touch base on ASHRAE in a moment. They wrote it for people who are designing buildings, not for thermal uh, conductivity experts. Um, so that's, that's a key part of this, and I think, you know, the, there's almost like no excuse to, to not understand it because it is out there in a very common language for designers to use. Now, um, why panels? Uh, you know, we're in this business, so obviously we care about it, but uh, the growth of this business is the reason why my business is flourishing. So this is down the street at the data center designed by WSMNH. In the past, they might have gone precast. In fact, they told us they had looked at that. Um, instead, they did a steel stud insulated wall system um, with a ceramic cladding on the outside of it. So panel interest is growing, and so the ability to build this stuff outside of the structure and do it right, that's what we're talking about uh, today. Um, and you, if you go down there, you can see it in mid-construction. You'll know, see that uh, part of the building is done and part of the building is still under mid-construction. You can sort of get the points that I'm making. So what, what I mean by a panel, just to be clear, um, uh, aluminum composite panels, probably the most popular one, the fiber cements, the phenolics, porcelain, ceramics, stone veneers, zinc, all sorts of metals, steel, generic metals. These are all the panel systems that we're talking about that are lightweight cladding built with cladding substructures on the outside of commercial uh, structures like steel stud construction. And, um, and in essence, what it, um, kind of looks like this, and we talk about it as a ventilated, rear ventilated rain screen facade. Um, RVRS is just an acronym we came up with, but ventilated facade is more of the general concept. So just to make, and again, just to define the space a little bit, so you got a lightweight panel on the outside, it's open top and bottom, probably open in the middle, and it's supported on a substructure of the insulation cavity. There's a breathable membrane at the back of the, the, the cavity, uh, and there's an air vapor barrier on the warm side of the insulation and then steel stud construction. Now, the steel stud construction isn't, um, isn't a must. I mean, there's concrete and block and all sorts of other constructions. It's just what we see the most of. Uh, but you could design these types of ventilated facades over top of pretty well anything. Um, but that's the, what we're defining. So uh, we're defining opaque walls, ventilated facade with panels, and you're trying to put the insulation, of course, outside of the structure. Um, so the thermal bridging of the studs is irrelevant now because the studs are all warm, uh, and it's really the thermal bridging of the cladding substructure, which is the challenge that we're trying to solve. So then, uh, so that, that's the definition of the space. Is there any questions on the definition of what we're talking about here today? Okay. So let's just uh, dig a little deeper. Um, the, the terms, I was having breakfast with uh, one of the building envelope science guys, and, and uh, he encouraged me to just define these things up front in a nice, clear way, because it isn't, um, I guess, just common knowledge. So you'll read about U-value, which is the thermal conductance of metal, of insulation, of windows, et cetera. The inverse of that is R-value, and that's what I tend to refer to as the thermal resistance. And um, what we've talked about in the past, um, and Jeff was making a joke at the booth a few minutes ago. It says on the bag it's R20, so it must be R20 for my building, and that's actually how we've been building buildings for some time. So if I put four inches of insulation and it's, it's R value is four, four times four is uh, 16, I get an R16 building, correct? No. So, but that's actually how we've been doing it, and it really all it does is measure one point in the wall, and it measures the nominal R value of where the insulation is and takes into account nothing else. It takes no window bridges, no uh, slab uh, edge bridges, and of course, no bridges of many metal going through the insulation. And that's what the new term, if you will, uh, effective R value is all about. So ev everything you'll read in ASHRAE 90.1, NECB, the code, uh, is talking about the word effective R value. And that's a comment about the building. 
and maybe when you bring it down from the building in total to the opaque wall, that's what we're talking about. So it's the total wall performance. It's not just actually the performance of the insulation. So the, the performance from the warm side to the cold side, it's the entire thing. Um, and it does account for the thermal bridges in, that have been designed into the building. So that's the word and that's the term. Um, in essence, uh, somewhere along the line, you'll be asking your client or maybe telling them, uh, the effect of our value that you want for your building is X. And X might be from the code, it might be from a good collaboration with a building en envelope uh, scientist, or, uh, or other criteria that you might have. But it's not the old, I, I got room for four inches of insulation, what does that get me? Or I got, I'm gonna put two and a half inches of rigid on the outside of the steel studs and see what that gets me. Um, it's not, that's not what it, the, the, the direction is. Um, so just to come and kind of back up just a touch, so that steel stud, uh, studs aren't the problem because they're on the warm side. The, the metal going through the insulation is a thousand times higher conductance than the insulation. And that energy loss is from the warm side to the cold side, obviously, but it's not about the connection of that metal to the stud. It's about the fact that that girt is warm on one side and cold on the other, so letting heat out. Um, in trying to prepare for this and looking at what we presented last year, uh, I ran a little survey and I published it last night on LinkedIn and on, my, uh, on our website. And it, I think it was kind of cool. So I interviewed, uh, I, I sent out an uh, email to 3,500 people, architects, and I got about two or 3% return rate, which is pretty good because I uh, didn't really tell them it was coming. And, you know, it's probably the first time I ever asked them for something to tell me, so that was pretty cool. Um, I didn't know where I was gonna go. So the first thing as I did is I asked uh, from a one to 10, um, is, is thermal bridging in facade design important? And let people define importance on their own. And 82% uh, of them said it's important. Now anybody who knows surveying sees that anybody who actually answers the survey is gonna think it's important. So I'm not surprised it was high but I'm a little surprised it's 82%. It, did, it wasn't 50, right? And then the next, the next question I asked, which I think is pretty cool, was is it so important that you as an individual are digging into this yourself? And that number was up in the 60s. Um, that was really startling to me because, you know, let's say you're a partner of, a law, of an architecture firm, you got a lot on your plate. And um, of the things you might wanna respond to, you might go, well, I know that's important, but so is use of water, so is daylighting, all these things. I'm gonna delegate all these things out to my lieutenants and let them come back to me with the right way. Well, 60 some percent of the people who responded are actually digging into themselves. Um, some find it important, but they delegate it to others. Some declared they're following the code minimums. And then this last piece was a little bit alarming, but I kind of expected it, that the clients, very few numbers of the clients are actually asking for it which kind of goes back to chart number three. If we don't lead, it's not coming. Like the, uh, you know, you might have a, a government uh, client who understands this stuff and they've put the time and resources into it and maybe their city tells them you've got to do these things, but you're going to have a lot of clients that don't know that they don't know. Um, and I don't think that the direction of change is going to be to change that population quickly because there's so many of them. Um, the place is here. Um, uh, and then th this was kind of interesting. I, I can't remember if it meant they could click more than one. I think they can only click more than one. I mean, I think they can only click one, but I gotta, I gotta go back and check this. So I threw in the R values that are in the different heat day rate uh, map across Canada. So you'll see in a moment, as you may know, there are minimum R values for walls in places across Canada. And in Ontario, it's, or in Southern Ontario, it's R18 and then it goes all the way to R31. And I said, uh, what R value did you use, effective R value did you use in your most recent project? Um, I snuck in R12 there as a bit of a trick because there is nothing in the code about R12, that's too low. But I know I've built buildings with R12 in the last 10 years and, um, and, they, and, and they were allowed. Well, a certain number of people said they're building it with R12. Um, it, I guess a kind of a good number was R20. You know, if, we're getting, if people are starting to design their buildings on average around R20, that's a pretty good number uh, to some level. Uh, it's better than it was with R12. Um, but I just, I just told that uh, story down at the booth to one of the Morrison-Hirschfield guys, 
and he started to laugh because he was uh, going in to visit somebody uh, in Mississauga and across the street was a building being built with continuous vertical girts, uh, two foot on center or something like that. And you know, this is a building that would have got its permit sometime in the last you know, six to 18 months because it's under construction now and it got through. So it's not happening, but people are declaring it is. So that's kind of interesting. And then the, I threw in the last one, uh, every, every building is different. Uh, that was a little bit of a trick as well. It is true, every building is different. If you're building a 40, 50 story high rise, um, you know, the roof doesn't matter that much. Um, it does matter what you did with all the glass. And there may not be that much opaque wall, but that matters too. But every building is different and it does come down to how lay, lay, things lay out. If you're building a one story factory and, and you know, you got this massive flat roof, then of course the real driving factor for the performance of that building is gonna be the performance of the roof, not so much the opaque walls. But nonetheless, if you're designing a building with effective R values of like 12 or less, on any shape building, I would propose to you that you're not getting it there. You're, you, know, you can do all the other things right and you're probably not getting what we're trying to in intend in the direction of the code. Um, and I think that's a good little spot. Sure. I'm just gonna, so any questions on that survey? I, I, I was really interested in the results. Uh, any of it surprise you? Or any questions up to here, up to this point? Okay. Please. Okay. How do the uh, builders or governors know the, uh, the R value, the effective of the R value? If you say you do a wall section and you provide, you know, R20 information, how would they calculate that? Do they know or do they? Um, so it's, you, it's almost like a. Uh, I didn't pay you to ask that question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, what, it's a very good question. Now, uh, the reaction, the first part of the answer is that, um, um, the, sorry, I apologize. Yeah, the question was, how does, when you send in your drawings and you send in for permit, how do the building code official or the planning department know what effect of our value you're creating? Um, the first, or, or, or better, once the building is built up to a point where the insulation's on the wall, does everybody just assume that it's right? Right. So the, the answer, uh, I can't answer the whole question because I've actually, I'm not an architect. I've never gone through the process of sending in a set of drawings to the city. Um, but um, I've got two, two points of view. One is that's what these folks like Morrison Hurstfield and the others, Intermodal and stuff, when they model your building, they're going to create a report that can be part of the submission. Um, I was um, curious about that question myself, and I called up the chief building official of Ontario. Uh, he's on vacation, so I got another person, really nice guy, really knows his stuff. However, one of the things he said was, um, um, you know, when it comes to ICI buildings, the only place that's really relevant is in the big cities, because in the small towns, the, the guy and the building official may get three of those a year, and he doesn't have that many, number one. Number two, you know, we're still learning about it, so we're counting on the people that are doing, the professionals that are stamping the drawings and doing the work. So if we see a building come to us that's insulated, we assume it's insulated correctly to SB10 here in Ontario or so forth. So as a taxpayer, it made me a little surprised. <laughs> but I mean, it's sort of a natural reaction to the fact that this team, and, and he also communicated that they're focused on safety, fire safety, structural safety, um, and, that, and I've never done their job, so I don't know. Uh, but what, what I think was coming out of this is once again back to my original assertion that it's gonna have to come from the architecture and engineering community to do it right. And I think over time, you know, there'll be probably ways to have tighter communication and maybe what I would call better regulation. Um, but you, clearly from what I'm seeing, you can build a building as far as thermal behavior pretty well any way you want. Um, because I know how many buildings we've done that are thermally broken, and, I've, and I also know that we're one of the leaders, so I'm not building, you know, you know I'm not, we're not getting, the phone's not ringing way off the hook to get this going. Um, so the answer is I think you could send in pretty well any drawings you want to show it's insulated, and, then, and they're probably gonna look at the air barrier. That's one pretty big one, and I think they already got that in their process. And then um, 
it, but it's going to be kind of up to you to know whether you got the effect of R value. And if anybody else has any more knowledge on the answering of that question, I'm happy to. A model, yeah. Yes. When I asked that question, we had a seminar on the adoption of the new National Energy Code. Um, the authority said um, that they um, would expect the professionals to administer it. Yes. They didn't have the skill or the knowledge. Yeah, well, that's the message yesterday I got. Yeah. yeah. Um, and they don't want the liability. Yes, they need to push it all off. Yeah. 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 I guess when we get into this a little further, the only thing I want to make, there's, it's not hard to do. Like, this isn't hard to do right. So we're not, um, we're not trying to quit smoking here. <laughs> you know, like this is just, this is good stuff. This is easy. Um, I'll hand the <laughs> make it personal. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jeff. Um, so, uh, We're going to talk a little bit about <clears throat> how we got here. And <clears throat> one of the things I thought about to the answer of your question was in terms of a building, there, there is a good start, anyways. It's certainly, there are some very simple charts that, that are provided in the industry, some of which we provide, which outline here's the nominal value of a given amount of insulation of a particular type. <clears throat> um, here are some. Uh, thermally broken substructures that provide this type of performance and combine with them you can probably assess you know I'm getting in and around X amount of insulation now let's not take into consideration a lot of other areas on the building that could be leaking of course but at least you'd have a good start um, it, certainly if you're promoting a uh, a reasonable thermally broken substructure or a clip or something like that, you'd have to have done testing. It'll have to be done by a legitimate body, and it'll have to be some data, some factual data published to give you performance. And then there's the performance of the given insulation that you're using. So you could um, start that way. And, and as Blair said, like this is not diff this is not difficult. That would be a really good start. And I'll probably tell you 80% of your story right off the bat. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> I mean, we've got ASHRAE, we've got the National Building um, Code. Uh, we've got a lot of things uh, trying to point us in the right direction. And we certainly took an interest in this, uh, part and parcel, because amazingly enough, from sort of a, a, a roots, a grassroots sort of movement, uh, I guess our, our CEO, John Kubasek, he has a lot of experience in, in building. And he knew from a very young age that driving uh, cold steel through insulation couldn't possibly be a good solution. If you can't hold on to the steel with your bare hands because it's so cold and it's going through the insulation, it's obviously conducting. So we sort of knew from, from that standpoint. And then we had some help, of course, because as time went on, ASHRAE step in and say, um, walls are very important. Walls take up a lot of area on a building. Uh, so let's, let's address that in terms of importance. And then uh, let's try to create better buildings and thermal bridges and breaking those thermal bridges is not new to us. Okay, so if we combine all those things together, um, we can definitely be pointed in the right direction. Now, the conversation definitely needs to start of uh, what effective R value do you need as opposed to, well, I want my wall to be this thick or et cetera, or I need it to meet my windows or what have you. So uh, w when we start off in this, uh, in this direction, then uh, we're probably better headed for success. So <clears throat> a combination of these type of things, like continuous air barriers, elimination of those bridges, higher efficiency, uh, we need to address things like climatic zones because we have different requirements. So there's some system thinking that needs to take place here. And we've got some, some sources of thermal region, which I'm sure you can probably imagine, uh, slab edges being a big one, windows and door frames, metal substructures and cladding, which is a big thing that we address, and then of course uh, parapets. So <clears throat> there's the old way, and Blair was drawing attention to this in some of the previous slides, of the old ways and what we used to do and what won't do, and 
as a nominal R value of a given installation being 16 and effective being 10.2. And I think that's, uh, that's if we're running horizontally like you have right here, which is about a 60 change percent, whereas it could even be worse than that. It could be around just over 50 percent of the nominal value of insulation that you're getting if you're running those girts vertically. There's even uh, more transfer. So um, we can't answer these, these, these problems uh, with more and more insulation, just like we can't just simply make sure people have a big enough bucket for their leaky boat. So the old ways, vertical Z girts, horizontal Z girts, vertical and horizontal, which people refer to as cross girding, um, there's an insulation factor there, and I believe it's something along the lines of about 52%, oh, maybe 63, up into the 70s for cross girding. It's, it's okay, uh, but that's all it is, is okay. We can do a heck of a lot better than that when we consider that we have uh, thermally broken substructures which are giving people 96, 98% of the nominal value of their insulation. And in many respects, it's not costing a whole lot more. In fact, it may not cost any more to provide these types of thermally broken substructures. And the interesting thing about cross girding, which is a, a, a reasonable uh, solution to get better insulation value of your walls, it's actually a more expensive way to construct. So because that tends to drive a lot of our construction, our building design of expense, when you're cross girding, you're putting on a horizontal girt system, insulating, running around the building, then coming around again, putting vertical girts on, adding some more insulation, you're going around the building twice. That can't possibly be an efficient use of labor, which is a large portion of the cost of our construction. So cross girding, uh, it's simply an okay method to get better uh, insulation value of our buildings, but it's definitely more expensive. Um, so we're looking there, I wasn't far, 52, 64, 73. And our norm, nominal value, we're starting off at 21, and we're ending up with 11, 13, and 15. Well, we can do a, a heck of a lot better than that. Now these, and of course, you know, these numbers are provided to us by Morrison Hirschfeld, so they're factual. <clears throat> so we've got all these different areas in Canada, and we've got our heating degree days, which we have to take into consideration. And we, from then, establish what zone we're in and what effective our value, our wall, should be at, certainly from a prescriptive standpoint. So <clears throat> we look at that. The effective R value range goes somewhere from 18 to 31. Uh, so that, that's definitely something to consider, and you want to take that into consideration in the area that you're uh, designing for. And the status of the code, as we see it in Canada, there's uh, various degrees of, of um, acceptance to these better ways of constructing. Uh, Ontario is certainly doing a decent amount. Uh, BC is leading uh, very, very well. Uh, City of Vancouver has done an exceptional job. And so as we go through the country, as I say, there's, a, there's various degrees of acceptance to this. Um, and hopefully that's going to change. And it's certainly changing. It's going to change in Ontario very soon. Uh, where buildings are going to have to perform significantly better. Um, so, the impact to buildings. Well, as we made a reference before to systems thinking, uh, it's not just one thing. There's a variety of things here that need to be taken into consideration. Um, ultimately, the goal is to save energy, um, but in terms of energy as well, uh, am amazingly enough, uh, the lighter cladding needs less structure ultimately uh, we're also making a movement to build with less mass. There's less energy involved typically there as well in building with less mass. Um, but better thermal performance, strong light substructures, uh, quality materials which don't need to be maintained, cared for as frequently or as much. And all in all, uh, when we're, we're trying to have a high effectively continuous insulation, which is generally with a, with a thermally broken substructure, there are some other things that we need to take into consideration as well, such as design freedom, which is a big one, which can't be taken for granted. Um, we need it to be a cost-effective scenario, and uh, certainly there are some solutions which are. 
out there. Uh, a non-combustible component, that's a reality for many buildings uh, to be non-combustible. Uh, suitable for ventilated facade, well, uh, the um, certainly a great enough success being had in Europe uh, with the design of ventilated facade. It's certainly something that we practice in terms of having active plenums uh, running behind our panels and, and we can see some uh, uh, some slides coming up that will demonstrate that. It's good for the insulation, it's good for the panel. Uh, and, but a system that works for all insulations as well. So we need something to be very, very flexible and high performing. Um, <clears throat> and in terms of the design freedom component, because it's, it's, it's not a light subject, buildings need to look fantastic as well, as well as perform well. So uh, finding a system which will give you all the freedom to design or rather maybe just not limit you in any way to put the material that you want in the module sizes that you want uh, fitting the aesthetic that obviously suits yourself and the client. So when we look at this, <clears throat> we've got some thicker walls potentially, four inch minimum. Your typically effective R value out of four inches of insulation is gonna be in around the 17 mark, 17 and change. So. I think for a lot of areas in Canada, we're certainly up to five inches of mineral wool anyways, uh, where we're achieving about R4.3 per inch. So uh, that'll get us a nominal value of about R21 and then get about 96 to 98% of that, we can probably hit R20, effective. But we need flexible system, say for shapes, and I, I think I've made my point clear enough about design freedom, um, we need to make sure how is this thermally broken substructure created? How does it move out from the building uh, in terms of uh, where does it tie in? How does the panel fasten to it? Uh, continuous air vapor barrier possible and a continuous weather barrier. Uh, it's certainly part of the system that we uh, practice where we have a weather barrier that sits in front of a lot of the insulations and to act as either a secondary drainage plane, eliminate wind washing, um, and uh, also from an aesthetic standpoint, for a lot of the panel systems that are created these days, you have a lot of an open joint system. Well, having a, a black backdrop behind that is a big point, so you're not looking through the panel system seeing particular name brand of a product written upside down, uh, or uh, for that matter, having um, seeing the insulation. So having a backdrop in there, and I, I think what I, I was assuming there, I was speaking about a black backdrop, is there are some black uh, systems, weather barriers, uh, which can be used. It's certainly one of the brands that we employ. Uh, so that, that's, uh, that's part and parcel of the design. So we've got a number of different types of thermally broken substructures which can be used here. Uh, some of these you'll recognize, some name brand products. And this is how they lay out in a lot of respects. Um, with our system, uh, say a particular clip, which is not uncommon to uh, some of the systems we are looking at here, the clips fasten back and a lot of them are designed for uh, structural steel stud subwalls. So they'll generally go in on 16 inch centers. Um, now with some of them that can withstand, a, have much higher structural capabilities, you can maybe push them out further than that if you're working with concrete, let's say, uh, where you're not stuck to a 16 inch center. You may be able to spread those clips out because they can withstand greater loads. Um, please refer to things like structural guides for those clips to see where your freedom can be. Um, but we're coming out with the clip, of course. It's a standard type of detail for a ventilated facade. We've got our insulation sitting on that cavity. Then that, that the, um, black area right there is our weather membrane protecting the insulation. And our vertical hat bar, I was talking before about the ventilation and the active plenum that we're creating. By having that last frontier just before the panel uh, as a vertical member, we've got an unobstructed cavity where airflow can move. Uh, and the benefit certainly of that particular design is that the airflow can move up through that cavity, creating a vacuum, pulling moisture through that breathable membrane out of the insulation, keeping that cavity dry always. And of course, 
Uh, amazingly enough, uh, Morris and Hirschfield were able to find that in a 25 millimeter cavity like that, people could benefit from uh, R0.7 to 0.9. Uh, so you've got some added insulation performance there in that air cavity. Um, <clears throat> another, uh, say another perspective looking at the same we were doing there where we've used mineral wool in the, uh, in the slide and the horizontal plane which is split up between the thermally broken clips and the horizontal member and then our vertical on top of that. And our clips are simply sitting on top of the sheathing. If it was only an outboard insulated uh, scenario, then we would have our AV barrier just behind the clips on top of that sheathing, okay? <clears throat> this is a typical um, uh, say uh, I information slide showing you where your nominal values of insulation lie uh, in here, depending on the thicknesses of your insulation. And this is specific to mineral wool. And as you move across, you've got, certainly for our system, uh, we, can, we can speak of that, um, the, the C-clip system that we employ, the vertical clip spacing, which is specific to the spacing between the horizontal girts for all intents and purposes, the horizontal clips. Um, when we originally put this table together, we figured, okay, well, if we're going up a building and going up 30 stories, et cetera, wind loads will be greater, et cetera, et cetera. We might need to bring the clips closer together. Now, amazingly enough, this chart was created before we went to Reed Jones Christofferson to have the clip tested. Uh, and um, they came back with you know, great results saying this is an incredibly strong clip. You'll probably never have to dip much below 48 inch vertical clip spacing. So if we take 48 inch vertical clip spacing and we're hitting the 16s across the wall, out of five inches of insulation with a nominal value of R21, we're hitting 20.8. So as I say, uh, from an objective standpoint, the effect of our values can be achieved quite easily through these thermally broken substructures. Uh, all we need to do is use them. Uh, but if we veer from that, then we're into continuous verticals or continuous horizontals. You can see we're well below certainly the prescriptive path in terms of the effect of our values we need for this part of Ontario that we're sitting in right now. So, we're at about 99% there, which is certainly a pass. 99% being of the nominal value of the insulation, but the other ones definitely fail. So um, let's say uh, this type of information should be provided by most of the thermally broken clips that, or substructures that are on the market. And it should be factual information from a, a, a body such as Morris and Hirschfield. <clears throat> So the executive summary here of our system is that the engineered assemblies thermal clip system, our clip system is an, an aluminum-based clip system. And um, it's for, as it suggests, for attaching rain screen cladding systems. We contracted Morrison Hirschfield to do all the testing for it from a thermal standpoint, and Reed Jones Christofferson was contracted to do it from a structural standpoint. Um, it's compromised of aluminum clips with a cork neoprene gasket as one of the thermal breaks. And we also have an aerogel component on the back of the clip to prevent some radiation that would occur in terms of heat energy. And um, <clears throat> with that, uh, we get a very effective thermally broken clip system, which is highly thermally broken and structurally very, very sound, very strong, because it's made out of aluminum. It actually affords us the ability to space the clips much further apart. Now, the further you space the clips or the fewer clips or attachment points you have would obviously result in um, less transfer, so higher performance, though it is nominal. It's a small degree. Uh, when you put the whole thing in perspective, but what it really does translate into is less people hours. So if you can find a clip system which has a very high, high structural performance to it, you'll have 
maybe half as many people hours or less than half people hours fastening these systems onto a building, which is going to obviously reduce costs of construction to a great degree. Yes? Was there ever any investigation made about using a stainless steel clip or a stainless steel design that was less conductive than steel? Or the stainless steel is definitely a lot less conductive, pretty expensive. So we, we calculated it, um, we did do some calculations on a similar shape but in stainless. And um, in essence, because the benefit is the whole system, the clip's one part of it, but it's because we're also pushing the GERD out because of those thermal breaks. For the extra cost of going to stainless, we weren't going to go from 99 to 99.9. .9, so it didn't really have an ROI. And aluminum is, is much easier to get and easier to ship and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, I, so we looked at it, but we kind of passed over it pretty fast, um, simply because there didn't seem to be a huge ROI. And obviously, we're trying to keep costs down so that things get um, adopted. Um, and the screws still have to be screwed. Mm -hmm. um, we're using the climate seal fasteners. So I don't think we're using stainless fasteners. No. no. Regular steel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. again, for, for cost reasons to make sure that you're getting into price point. Mm -hmm. Because the idea that in the, in the old days you were taking uh, 18 gauge, uh, maybe two or three inches of, of galvanized steel girts, and you had, you had them running two to three feet on center, and that's what you're trying to replace with a clip, spread them out, and you have to spend some more money to get a clip versus just a bent piece of metal. Uh, so it's a game of inches in order to try to, you know, maintain the cost point as well as maintain the thermal performance. Um, so they just didn't seem to have the ROI to us. It's, it, it's a good point because it's, it's something that we never lost focus of. Um, with the help of the codes coming along and essentially mm -hmm. demanding that we get higher and higher performance out of our buildings, we didn't lose sight of the fact that if, if a system is created that's difficult to install, or that is expensive, there's going to be pushback, there's going to be loopholes created, it's sort of inevitable. So when we designed our system, certainly we figured let's use a material that people are familiar with, it's easy to manipulate, uh, and design it in a way that goes up easily, quickly, uh, so that uh, the cost difference between using a standard adjustable Z-Gert system is next to nothing. Because amazingly enough, in, in, in one respect, we're, all, we're pretty much guaranteed we're always going to end up with subwalls that are somewhat misaligned. So we're going to need alignment. And uh, one of the benefits to the T-Clip system is that it has adjustability in it. Um, so we can adjust for subwall misalignment. Now, to bring this thing around, uh, the point is, is we figured Adjustable girts are something that get employed to a great degree. If we could bring a system in that will come in line with adjustable girts, it should be a non-discussion. It's the same price as an adjustable girt system, and you're getting thermally broken uh, at, at the same point. So um, it, it was definitely something that we took into consideration was uh, cost, obviously. So the T-Clip system, it does meet the prescriptive requirements for non-residential steel construction, ASHRAE 90.1, for all climate zones in Canada. We can achieve that. Um, it's validated through a finite element analysis of morrison Hirschfield, designed for mid and high-rise non-combustible building envelopes. Um, some of these facts were drawn up before we had it tested by Reed Jones Christofferson, amazingly enough. Um, we, we made sure that it could accommodate our 8 to 26 millimeter products, which might get into the uh, 8 to 10 pounds per square foot of cladding systems. Uh, we were delighted to hear when RJC came back and said, you could actually go probably in around 40 pounds of dead load onto these clips, and they could probably withstand somewhere, in some cases, up to about 140 PSF plus. Uh, well, well in excess of what we considered when we thought, we'll engineer it up to 50 PSF. So very, very strong system. And these types of systems need to be created because eventually we could be putting a thermally broken substructure 
80 stories in the air. Well, it needs to withstand an incredible wind load up there. And depending on the products, we can't limit products. Uh, so it needs to be able to handle incredible dead loads. So a model that holds for all insulations as we start loading on more and more insulation, uh, it's a bit of diminishing returns. Uh, so uh, we pick the best insulation that people can afford, and certainly the insulation that can, uh, can give us the effective R value that people need, and we um, say put it into the model, and uh, certainly the T-clip system can turn around with 90, 96, 98% of nominal value um, or better. So uh, as I say, the, the, the systems are definitely out there and uh, they definitely work. So in terms of the how many clips do you need for a particular building, well, that's, that's typically an engineering uh, a question and answer in some respects because uh, spreading out the clips uh, taking into consideration loads that you're dealing with, either dead load of the panel and wind loads, is something that needs to be answered. Uh, we were, we, we found out uh, doing a couple of projects with a large um, installation company here. They did some engineering and found that um, uh, with the, um, with system thinking, they could use very few clips. We're already starting off with a 48 inch vertical clip spacing. Uh, so 48 inches between our clips here. We've got 16 on 16 inch on center. But if you remember back uh, to some of the slides we were showing, where we've got the clip coming out, we've got a horizontal plane, and then we've got a vertical plane sitting on top of that, locking up the whole system. We've got a, a, a strong system there. Uh, this, this one client of ours found that on a, on a given elevation, they could put the clips 16 inch center for structural steel stud, they could hit the even studs, let's say on the top level, the odd studs in the middle, the evens on the bottom, and by the time you put your verticals and horizontals all together, you actually had great system strength, and it was stamped by engineers who said this, this will work. We're typically not in the business of telling people how to buy less of our systems, but it's, it's nice to know that we've got a system out there which is so strong and a system that performs well enough to be accepted by the standards that are being outlined today. Um, and uh, it, it was designed cleverly enough that it will cut costs. And I think that that's probably, the, the, we, we need all the help we can get. Uh, we, meaning all of us here, in terms of building buildings with better materials, uh, building less expensively and getting higher performance out of them. And I think we're heading in the right path and Canada's got a lot of great solutions for that. Um, so with that in mind, um, I'm going to turn things back over to Blair. Thanks, Jeff. Um, just to tune one comment, just to make sure. So when we created, well, when Morrison Hirschfield gave us this chart, this was done for um, uh, mineral wool. So that's why the the, the, the thickness of the wall at five inches, you had a nominal R21, and you got an, uh, an effective of R20.8 with 48 inch spacing. Um, the next question is, can I use other insulations? And the answer is yes, of course. So what they did is they did this analysis to prove that the ratios between effective and nominal are the same on, with the different insulations. And the reason why they say that is because they, uh, the one the black line is the theoretical uh, relationship between effective and nominal, and all the insulations were basically roughly the same. So in essence, if you went, if you took spray foam or you took some other type of R value insulation and you applied it to our chart, sorry, I'm going the wrong way, um, you could use the same relationship, but you might have a, end up with a thinner wall. So if it took you, uh, you know, you could get a nominal R value of 21 with four inches of another type of insulation, then you could design this building with a T100. So that's, that's a little bit of how. So we did the engineering with um, mineral wool because that is the product we see the most often, and it is the most uh, cost effective, um, and it's non-combustible. But uh, all the insulation companies have great products, and they all suit the system. I wanted to drive home this point in this presentation about design freedom because it's one of the things that we 
really tried to design around. Um, and um, we got clients doing really cool things. Uh, and we're kind of known as the guys to come to when you're trying to design something cool. This is on the drawing boards and almost out for tender. Um, this has been built in Austria. Um, it's kind of a cool design. Uh, it's actually only two shapes. And that drove a real interesting cost. Like, they actually did it very affordably. Um, this is a job we did out in Alberta with Clark Builders. Uh, the, uh, it's a Firestone metal product that's over top of our clip. And uh, this is a subsystem. We've done, this is in Europe, but we've done things like this too, where you get alternating uh, depths. Um, this is with fiber cement. Um, and then you got the pretty straightforward job. You know, not all the jobs are, you know, wild. This was a nice church we did up in Waterloo <coughs> with uh, basically a nice symmetric pattern. Um, but the reason why it matters is uh, when you are looking at thermally broken cladding systems from various vendors, which one of the factors you really want to understand is did you end up sacrificing your design freedom? Um, <clears throat> this is a plan view with the studs being at the top and the outside of the wall being at the bottom of the slide. And our clip is on each stud, but this vertical girt can be anywhere along the horizontal girt. And if you carefully look at uh, the design constraints of some of the other clip systems, they don't do that. Um, in fact, that was kind of one of the driving forces of why we invented our own was that if you couldn't bring this design freedom to people, then we probably couldn't sit in front of most of the architects that we do business with. Um, so that's a key factor. So you need to ask yourself questions when you're looking at the systems to make sure you're getting that kind of design freedom. Now, I'm going to jump into some technical detailing and some design and show you some pictures of, the, of those details. So that's how you used to do it, and that's how you're doing it now. And the only real major point is I wanted to, why there's three fasteners on the top of the T-clip is that gives you the adjustability. And I've been trying to figure out a way to actually present that. Um, I've probably got to go to a job site and videotape something, but steel stud wall construction, framing construction, is getting worse, not better. So the walls are coming in like this, or they're going like this, and our guys, the cladding contractors, they have to make that wall look straight. So as the, you know, when the building's built, the architect's gonna walk over the corner, look straight up and go, okay, the building's okay, but um, the, the framing wasn't. Um, so in essence, one of the problems that we saw in the, in the marketplace when the, the first few clips came out uh, was this adjustability. And we're getting some really good feedback that we probably figured this out. An inch or so of, uh, of room there on the clip itself to solve this problem of framing adjustability. And then, of course, you could shim the cliff, the clip, <clears throat> and then if you had a really crazy wall, like you were recladding something in brick or stone or something, you could actually use different size clips. So, uh, you know, the cladding guys know how to do things, align things all, all day long, but one of the struggles they have is at the alignment of the wall itself. Uh, we designed it with three sizes, four, five, and six inches. That was simply to get the effect of our values that uh, you have. We do, we do recommend, um, and a couple of the morrison Hirschfield reports talk about the cavity behind the panel. Should you leave it open for insulation? Uh, leave, I'm sorry, leave the insulation open or should you put a weather membrane? We recommend a weather membrane. This keeps the insulation dry but allows the wall to breathe. Um, uh, so therefore, the ventilation going on behind the panel, so the, the last thing to go on this wall would be our panels, <coughs> uh, is uh, uh, drawing in, uh, condensation out of the wall system but it keeps rain from getting in. Um, and uh, we choose this product, one of the reasons we choose it is better for use for commercial use, uh, and it's black, as Jeff was commenting earlier, that when you look through the joints, you don't see anything. Um, so there are lots of different materials. I'm gonna mix drawings and pictures here so you get a feeling for how the construction goes. This was a spray foam job uh, downtown at Bridgepoint Hospital. It's called the Philip Aziz, uh, Philip Aziz Hospice. So the bottom left is framing and dense glass, and then we start putting on our clips in the top left uh, with our girts in the, in the middle. This was our first job, so we actually only spaced them about two and a half, three feet apart. Um, and it was a little later that we've discovered with better engineering that we could space them further. Um, then with the breathable membrane and the panels themselves. <clears throat> we, um, this was a bit of a marketing effort. We, this job was designed a long time ago, uh, and uh, it was only until the funding came through so it had its permits and things like that. Um, it wasn't designed with a thermally broken facade, but it was designed with four inches of insulation. So uh, we proposed to the client and um, we, you know, we ate the difference and there wasn't much difference to eat. So we sort of proved to ourselves that you could design it with a thermally broken facade for about the same number. Uh, this is uh, 
uh, down the street. Uh, if you're interested going down, it's at Front Street in Parliament. It's a data center. So it's the perfect cladding job because it's a big box, five stories high, and no windows because it's just going to fill up with computers and routers and things. Uh, and uh, you can, if you go down there, you can see various levels of construction because they're going around the building and some portions are completed and some aren't. And so this picture is showing you places where we just have the clip and the horizontal girt. Uh, this is a job out in, uh, out in Vancouver called Shannon Estates and uh, showing you the up front where, where the clips are as well as uh, where the girts are. Uh, I guess I already showed you that. There's another type of vertical girt. Sometimes we have to do that if we're doing running bond and you need to fasten panels um, below that joint. There's an example with the, with the, um, with the insulation. Now, I've got to go back to these folks and understand that we believe you don't need any uh, 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 insulation mm -hmm. pins anymore you don't. because you can put a membrane in the vertical girts. And that could be, and we know these folks really well, that this was going to be left open for a while because they were going around the building. I don't know. But uh, they could have saved a few bucks by not having any of the insulation clips. And this is the data center again, showing you with insulation now in. And the, the other reason to try to meet this holy grail of four feet apart is the insulation is four feet. So the, the installer could just pop, pop in the uh, bats of insulation very effectively. The window, the window detail, this is a typical. Um, one of the things we look for is that it's simple. The, the clip is fastened to a stud near the window, but not right there. It doesn't complicate the whole window detail. And then we tend to have a trim that gives a place for the window contractor to fasten using his uh, uh, caulking joints. Our membranes wrap nicely into the window joints. Um, and we think this is the kind of construction that is very inspectable, so you can know what you actually got. Um, this was an interesting, this isn't that, a picture of what you just saw. <laughs> this is our friends in Vancouver on the Shannon Estates project. They've got these very large windows that actually protrude from the building and they were wondering how they were going to structurally hold them. So they actually took our load test, our load documents for the clip and the clip itself is holding in this window. So they've taken our, our load, uh, our actual engineering of the individual clip and they've designed the clip into their window structure. So never know what a client's going to go do, so we've given them the engineering data to let them to do that. Uh, this is a job in Alberta. Uh, it's the Physical and Wellness Center at the University of Alberta. It's the entry to the building, and it's a big conical-shaped building, so it was pretty hard to model, um, and it was pretty hard to figure out how to do it. And with the clip, we were able to allow horizontal girts that have been spliced together to go around the curve and once again hit pretty close to that four foot on center so the insulation can go in well. Then they put deck and uh, a Firestone metal panel over, over the, so they can get, uh, oh, that's interesting. So they can get that look. So um, I don't know what's on the rest of the building, but the uh, lobby is gonna be perfectly thermally broken. Uh, and you know, the, the reality of what's happening out in places like that is uh, they're already putting four <coughs> inches of insulation on their code doesn't call for thermally broken, but if they're going to put four inches of insulation on anyways, these kinds of systems, like the one we have, make it just as easy to construct because we get the spacings all spread out and so forth. The corner detail I referred to earlier, for some of the early clip systems that we saw had these really crazy things you had to do at corners. And all we've done here is you got a clip on each uh, stud outside of the corner because you can't fasten to the structural steel a uh, cantilevered horizontal girt that's all brought together with one vertical girt. And it's just simple, easily designed, easily inspected, and cost efficient. And so when you're looking at these clip systems, you should be looking for corner details and window details that make sense to you. And if you can't figure it out in about four, four seconds, then it probably doesn't make sense. These are uh, some shop drawings showing ventilated facade with uh, the, the transition from a facade to a soffit and the clip working fine in a vertical way as well. And so you're seeing open ventilated joints at the top and the bottom of this parapet. Another type of window detail. And the things that we were uh, just in summary trying to make sure we were constructible, and that's partly because we're doing it ourselves. So if we had put the product out to our own teams and they'd come back and swear and cursed at us, uh, we would have been, <laughs> we'd been in some trouble. So what we were looking for was adjustability, uh, and so when you're looking at systems, you should look for these things too. We're looking for vertical girt independence so the panels can be wherever you want them to be. 
and we want window details to be simple. I didn't quite get this chart in here, but I'll refer to it. The University of BC students, uh, they did an analysis of all these terms as well. Um, so there's some good data. I didn't quite get that in there. Um, future, uh, and I'll be on time here, is what I see going down in the future is uh, fewer clips. So people are now taking these loads, understanding the structural <coughs> loading of the wall. And for example, we're doing a job, as Jeff was commenting, uh, the, they're, they're skipping a stud, so they got to clip every stud, and then down below it's the staggered, and uh, and I think you're going to see more of that. It does take a little more knowledge. Uh, when we came out with the clip on every stud concept, we did it for just practicality, and of course we can sell some some clips, so you know, mea culpa. But um, but uh, we recognize that if somebody doesn't actually do the structural engineering to find out where the clips could be. Uh, just coming up with something like, hey, skip every other stud. We might end up with compromises that wouldn't work. There are new designs, and I'll show you one in a second. And then I think this is coming. Other things on the outside, stone veneers, solar panels, communications, hardware. I think you're going to see facades have more uh, aspects to this, in in integrated aspects. This is a, uh, a design that's come to us from the spray foam folks, um, which I think is kind of cool. So what they've done is they've taken the sheathing uh, outside, so in pre previous drawings you saw it uh, next to the stud. They've moved it outside our horizontal girt, and then we put our breather membrane in the vertical girt and the panel, and you could spray foam from the inside and you could fill that entire cavity. Now my draftsman just put the cross uh, areas where the insulation could be only up to the stud, but obviously you could fill the whole stud. So you could go to R30, uh, spray foam internally. Now I'm not a spray foam expert, so I don't know what the implications are for spraying on the inside and whether that drive, you know, drives your cost up or not. I think it does a bit. Uh, if, you're, if you're spraying from the inside, you probably don't have the heating aspects of the winter. That was one thought. And you do have to watch how you do your fire stopping uh, from floor to floor. Um, but all those details from the people I've spoken to so far all seem quite reasonable. So th this was kind of a cool innovation based on our design that allows somebody to get a very, very highly effective R value um, in a new, new approach. Um, this is uh, just to let, leave it uh, on a high note with some finished buildings, just so you know, we build some buildings. Uh, this is the data center, and I think it's a couple days old. Uh, uh, one of the folks on our team uh, has a condo that looks over the data center, and that's one of the shots. This was the Philip Aziz Center. It's a nice, simple design. This is the Shannon Estates, and that's a rendering that Perkins Will has done, and so it's all around these window bays um, uh, that we're cladding, uh, and that project's going on. Um, and uh, so in essence, uh, the summary of, of today's chat, and I really appreciate the dialogue that we've had today. I, it's a great way to have a meeting. First of all, the building energy matters. The walls matter. Thermal bridges really do matter. Um, and it's been documented. We don't need to like, oh, I don't believe in this, or I don't know if this is really true. It, it's all there now. It's not, it's not a mystery. The code is setting higher minimums. And what you're going to see, especially interesting out of some of the cities, Toronto and Vancouver, are going to start setting the bars higher and higher. Um, and listen, basically, you won't, you, you kind of can't ignore it. Uh, constructible solutions do exist. And one of the things we've really tried to emphasize is if you, if you want to have four inches of insulation, or even somebody's asked us for three now, so we're probably going to develop a three inch clip, then um, these constructible solutions exist. Um, detailing is constructible and it is cost effective. And, um, you know, I, I, I can't, can't overemphasize that I think it's our community of architects and engineers and builders that are going to have to do this, and we can't just leave it for somebody else to go figure out. I don't think the owners are going to suddenly uh, all get it at one time. Uh, they need to be instructed on what can be done. Uh, and it's not something that we're really changing how you do your construction in some cons you know crazy way. We have a whole lot of information for you otherwise. Uh, and. Um, uh, and our website's a good source for that. So uh, let's go lead. And we are downstairs at booth 1040. Thank you ever so much.